Ramadan, 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 ya Habib, Ramadan, Ramadan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, wa kafa, wa salamun ala ibadihi ladhi nastafa. Khususan ala Sayyidi al-Rusri wa Khatam al-Anbiya, wa ala alihi al-Azkiya, wa ashabihi al-Atqiya. أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقترب للناس حسابهم وهم في غفلة معرضون ما يأتيهم من ذكر من ربهم محدث إلا استمعوه وهم يلعبون لا هي تنقلوبهم وأسر النجوى الذين ظلموا هل هذا إلا بشر مثلكم أَفَتَأْتُونَ السِّحْرَ وَأَنْتُمْ تُبْصِرُونَ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَظِيمُ Every year when Ramadan comes around, there is this internal conversation I have with myself. And it's one that I don't have the courage to verbalize. But if I said that I didn't have the conversation, I would be dishonest. And that is... Are you excited about the upcoming Ramadan? I know it's supposed to be the religious to-go statement to say I'm super geeked out about Ramadan because it's a religious season and to even doubt your excitement about Ramadan would be viewed as something frowned upon. But I have no shame in admitting that I need a lot of spiritual growth. And when Ramadan comes around, I begin to ask myself, are you excited? And this is based off of two things. The first thing is the physical commitment required by, by Ramadan, which means I have to shuffle my whole schedule around. Um, not only that, but there's exhaustion, the fatigue that comes along with fasting. But then there is another side of this, which is to do with the spiritual commitment. Am I ready to do this? And I think the second one is, one is the one that really gets me thinking, are you ready for Ramadan or not? Or are you looking forward to it or not? Because what I've noticed about myself, and many of us may share this observation, if we're honest, that when Ramadan comes, we give it our best. And then as Ramadan passes, sometimes within a 24-hour window, we find ourselves slipping back to the old version. And it hurts. It really does. Because it takes so much strength and courage to start becoming regular in the Hajjud and to read some Qur'an, and to stand during the night hours. And then seeing it all go away, it hurts so much. You begin to ask yourself if whether you will continue to be a seasonal Muslim until you enter the grave, whether any of this will actually change, whether those stories that we read in the books regarding the great scholars of the past be it the likes of Shaykh al-Hadith, Wala Muhammad Zakariya Khan Dahlabi, who our dear teacher and mentor, Shaykh Yusuf, rahimahullah, was um, immensely and almost in a positive way, obsessively in love with, loved him very much. And he would spend hours on hours talking to us about his mentor and teacher. Or the likes of Shaykh Ashraf Al-Tani, rahimahullah ta'ala who I understand these days in the UK has become a controversial figure. But it's a shame that people um, find controversy around such great giants. It's their loss, the truth is. And then, so we read these people and we read their stories. And I only name two figures. The truth is that history has a whole list of people who were so spiritually empowered that when we look at ourselves and try to Compared to them, we begin to realize that, gosh, the, the gap between the two is not even one that could be me- measured. How am I going to measure myself to Sheikh Ashraf Ali, rahimahullah, or Sheikh Zakaria, rahimahullah, or even Sheikh Yusuf, rahimahullah? These people were giants. So where do I fall in this? So then the question then comes back that, you know, am I excited about Ramadan? Because it's very likely that I'm going to try hard and then at the end of Ramadan, it's all going to go away. So is it worth it? Is it worth it or not? So there are two things that come to my mind that I want to share with you. Number one is the famous hadith of Hamdallah radiallahu anhu. Sahih riwayah. 
It's a Sahih Riwayah. In which the companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the name of Hamdara radiallahu anhu is walking around the streets of Medina Munawwara announcing out loud that I have become a hypocrite. The companions knew the man. He stood by the side of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in multiple battles and he claims he's a hypocrite. That sounds off. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu approached him and said, hey Hamdara, what's going on? So Hamdara radiallahu anhu says, oh Abu Bakr, when I'm in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet of Allah speaks, I am captured by the words of the Prophet. I feel the presence of the fire of hell and I feel the presence of paradise. I spiritually feel so uplifted. There is a ulu in my nafs and in my qalb. However, when I leave that gathering and go back home, life happens. Like to many of us, two days after Ramadan, life happens. You can't stay awake all night anymore in the masjid doing tahajjud, suhoor. You got to go to sleep because tomorrow morning you got work again. You got to go back to school tomorrow. Life's about to pick up. And as I get back home, alhamdulillah, an says, life happens and I, I'm back to a state of just being a human being. I'm no longer in that high spiritual state. And the fact that sometimes I'm so spiritually charged and other times I'm so spiritually depleted, it leads me to a single conclusion that I am a hypocrite. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an says, alhamdulillah, if this is your reality, then I, I attest that I'm the same as you. And if we hear of giants like this saying that they experience the ziyada and nuqsan in spiritual ahwal, they experience the increase and decrease in a spiritual state, men like Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, then that really raises a question that is it really blameworthy? Number one. Number two, how do we handle this? How do we deal with this? Shaitan is going to find all sorts of ways to make you feel guilty because once he has you on that guilt trip, if you don't know how to control it, you're in his palm. There are many ways that Shaitan deludes people. And one of them is through uh, making a person lose all their confidence and make them feel delusional that they are hated by God, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a fine line between being proud of yourself and yet being thankful to Allah. One person, they pray to Allah and they have pride in their heart. That I am so and so. I'm the big shot. And another person doesn't necessarily have pride, but they're thankful to Allah. Through their ibadah, they attest their gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has given them the ability to read the Qur'an, to memorize the Qur'an, so every time they read it, they thank Allah without the entitlement, without the entitlement. Uh, unfortunately, I see many people in our community adorning themselves with an artificial um, state of humbleness. And it honestly doesn't even look good. It looks very cheap. It's kind of like, you know, there is tawadu and there is tawadu bil takalluf. There is tawadu, which is natural humbleness. And then there is humbleness that in reality isn't really humbleness. It's just you showing off again. But this time you're showing off that you're humble. It's a very twisted way to show off. Abu Waqar Siddiq, he also agrees that, look, there are spiritual ups and downs. And I'm like you, alhamdulillah, I have spiritual highs and then I have spiritual lows. The two of them come to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they say, O oh, Messenger of Allah, this is the situation. To that, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, if you were able to maintain the spirituality that you experience in my presence, when you go back home, the angels would come and do musafaha with you. They would come and shake your hands. And that's not going to happen. So neither will you be able to maintain that 100%. The difference between the awliya of Allah and the awam, those close friends of Allah, and the common people. I, you know, when I, was, when I was a student, Allah blessed me with the opportunity to gain closeness to our teacher, Sheikh Yusuf Rahimahullah. The amazing thing was that when Sheikh Rahimahullah passed away, I made an intention to record a video sharing some of my experiences with the Sheikh and just that relationship. But then, it took me a little while to 
get a grip on myself and be ready to record something of that nature. In the meantime, so many other students had put their videos out and I didn't feel there was a need anymore because what they said was more than enough. And in particular, some of the people who put videos out were my teachers as well. So I didn't think there was any more space to contribute to this area. It was a, it, it had been dealt with sufficiently. But nonetheless, at least at the seminary, I teach at the Alamiya program and I sit with my students. These are students who sit with us for five days a week, eight hours a day. They're locked with us for five years, seven years. So they have no choice but to listen to what we have to say. And sometimes I share with them some of the stories that I uh, had with our Sheikh. When I was in my graduating year, Sheikh Yusuf Rahimullah had, an, had a shoulder injury. It was very severe because of which he was no longer able to drive. Rahimahullah, rahmatullah. So luckily I had a car. So he said to me, Hussein, I need someone to drive me around. So you're the one. Originally I was ridiculously intimidated because I don't know, I think Sheikh Yusuf was one of those people that when he entered into the room, your heart would stop beating. And I know that may sound like hyperbole, but for those who know, know that there's no exaggeration in this. There was a presence. Nonetheless, uh, I, I, I began to drive Sheikh around. And while we would drive, sometimes we'd get stuck in traffic and we'd be together in the car for hours. And then we'd have these conversations, which were very enlightening. So one time I asked Sheikh, I said to him, Sheikh, what's the difference between the khawas, the awliya of Allah, those that are very near to Allah, and those who are the common general people like you and I, like not, not you and I as in the Sheikh, but talking about us, you know, like us guys. There's us and then there's the, what's the difference? And I, I, I was jari, I had a tongue that needed to be held back, but I didn't. I said to him that when I look at some of the people who are attested to be the awliya of Allah by other scholars, like someone will tell me, so-and-so is a friend of Allah, and I would go and observe that person. Honestly, I didn't find anything special there. Even Sheikh Yusuf, rahimahullah, honestly, if you ask any of his students, there was nothing, you know, like, very outstanding about the way he prayed salah. It was special, don't get me wrong here, but it's not like he prayed 300 rak'at for Dhuhr salah or something. He prayed the same number of rak'at that we prayed. So then the Shaykh, he responded back to me by saying, the difference between the ibadah of the awliya of Allah and the awam isn't always seen in the external, rather it's manifested in the internal. That's where it is. It's when they're worshiping Allah, they have developed an ability through their excessive dhikr and through their excessive tilawa and through their excessive salah. And where people play on the surface level of this earth, these people have mined their heart and they're mining and mining and they're all the way down here, you understand? So when they're interacting with their heart, they're going very deep. They're really connecting with Allah. Let's go back to that narration of Alhamdulillah. So he says, O Messenger of Allah, I experience this and the Bisa Salaam says it's normal. And that's why it's important to know that to experience ghafla, Ghafla is the opposite of dhikr in Arabic. Dhikr means to be in a state of remembrance. Ghafla means to be in a state of forgetfulness, to not be in a state of remembrance. The awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the true friends of Allah, they experience ghafla too. However, when they experience ghafla, number one, they are able to identify that at this moment I am experiencing ghafla. They're able to identify it. You know, we have gone on for weeks of our life with Ramadan around the corner, and we can barely find ourselves to have few minutes every day of dhikr. Otherwise, the majority of the day is in ghafla. It's in forgetfulness. And this is shaitan's number one tactic against us, to put us in a state of ghafla. We live in an empire of marketing where every company that is in existence is paying thousands and millions of dollars just to have our attention. You think Apple just has our attention by coincidence? No, they put millions and potentially billions of dollars into the industry of marketing, so they have our attention. On one side, we barely have focus. On the other side, we have these multi-million dollar companies that are paying to attract our attention. And on the third side, you have that Muaddin saying, Hayya ala salah. You guys see that? 
the power of lafla is very strong. The power of dhikr barely exists. And therefore you have mankind that is lost. And ghafla being in a state of forgetfulness is the greatest afa of the heart. It's the greatest calamity of the heart as Imam Muhammad al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala writes. And this is why the ulama of the sawab and tazkiyah, they always recommend to be in a state of dhikr because dhikr repels ghafla. It gets rid of it. Now, in order to understand ghafla, there is one thing in particular that we have to appreciate. And that is that ghafla, like dhikr, is not a zero-sum situation where either you have ghafla or you don't. I don't want you to think of it like that, even though that may be true. But when, if you want to appreciate ghafla and understand how to deal with it, you have to come to terms with accepting that ghafla as a spectrum. The ibtida of ghafla is ghafla. And the intiha of it is i'rad. So ghafla is when a person is distracted. I'm having a conversation with you. I get a phone call or I get a text message. I look away for a moment. That's a moment of ghafla. I turned away from here. I'm not focused here anymore. I'm focused there. I'rad is when a person experiences so much ghafla. So first state of ghafla, let's put this in spiritual terms. Many people don't read Quran because they just don't remember to read Quran. That's who they are. If you were to put a Quran in their face and say, sit down and read it, they would very well read it. They have no problem reading the Quran. They enjoy it, but they're just forgetful of it. That is an innocent forgetfulness. But then there is a, a, an extreme on the other end of the spectrum where ghafla becomes i'rad. And now it's no longer passively forgetting to read the Quran, but you're actively choosing to avoid the Quran. Where now someone says, let's go to the masjid. And you're like, nah, I'm gonna, I gotta go somewhere. Does that sound familiar? Everyone gets together at a party and they're praying Isha Salah and you randomly make excuses to go do wudu even though you may already have it and you spend 20 minutes in the bathroom because you're actively avoiding to pray Salah. That's Iraq. اِقْتَرَبَ لِلنَّاسِ حِسَابُهُمْ وَهُمْ فِي غَفْلَةٍ مُعْرِضُونَ مُعْرِضُونَ They're doing Iraq. It's a dangerous place to be. Very dangerous. I'rad is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may take away from life of that person. Because I'rad is su'ul adab by Allah. Bad etiquette and manners of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one turns away from Allah. No one has a right to turn away from Allah. Forgiving, that's different. Rufi'an, ummati, al-khata, wa nisyan. If ghafla is in the level of nisyan, which is casual forgetting, then that's pardoned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. The true awliya of Allah, they minimize their windows of ghafla, number one. Number two, if ghafla and dhikr is a chart that goes up and down on the highs of the dhikr and the lows of the ghafla, the Awliya of Allah have found a way to minimize how low they dip when they go into ghafla. Where the average person might go all the way down here, the awliya of Allah take a small dip and they back up. Where they spend most of their time in, in dhikr. If you're wondering why we're having this whole discussion of dhikr and ghafla, well, it's because Ramadan's here. And if you want to make the most of your Ramadan, you're going to need to repel ghafla. That's what happens. This is how you do it. Any ibadah. Someone says to me, Sheikh, I want to learn how to focus deep in my salah. Simple solution. Outside of your salah, you have to get rid of your ghafla. The more you engage in dhikr outside salah, the easier it'll be for you to do dhikr inside salah. With Ramadan around the corner, with the two weeks ahead of us, I want you to start identifying your avenues of ghafla. What distracts you? Video games, TV, movies, TV shows, too much WhatsApp, too much social media, whatever it is that distracts you, too much news, that's also a thing. The world won't change if you don't check the news for two days. It's gonna go on. If you and I were to even die, we'd be lucky if people remember us three days later. Otherwise, the qaida of this dunya is that after someone dies, Soon after, people forget they even existed. 
what causes ghafla? You have to learn, identify it. And then those things need to be removed. And in place of that, you need to bring dhikr. Because as you bring dhikr into yourself, as you begin to remember Allah, any form of dhikr that you like, engage in it. Make this Ramadan, the Ramadan of dhikr. The highest form of dhikr, as our teacher Shafi Subhanahu would say to us, is tilawat al Quran. That's the highest form of dhikr, he used to say. I remember him saying the example of someone who develops their spirituality through the dhikr of the mashayikh is like someone who builds a home made of low quality materials. Low quality doesn't mean cheap or dirty, it just means in comparison to. Okay. A dhikr is always beautiful. There's no such thing as cheap or dirty about dhikr. And on the other hand, developing your spirituality through tilawat al-Qur'an, the example of that is like someone who builds a home from brick and mortar. It's the highest form of dhikr because you're engaging with the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the kalam nafsi of Allah. Kalam al-Nafdi is muhdab, but kalam nafdi is qadim, it's azali. Right? What you're reading, the words that you're reading are a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is timeless. That's the kalam nafsi. That's the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's, there's nothing in the world, nothing, that can match ever the kalam that belongs to Rabbul Ala. But this can only be appreciated by someone who has a ta'alluq with Allah, who has a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bring yourselves into a state of dhikr. Repel your ghafna. Mark my words, whether it's Ramadan or any day of the year, the ibadah that you do following a state of dhikr, one such that will change your life. You'll find yourself sitting and just reflecting over the favors of Allah. And the love of Allah will suck your heart in. Tears will begin to flow. This is how we prepare for Ramadan. I know other people will tell you, start eating less and start working out and start you know, doing this and doing that. Those are all beautiful advices. And these are advices given by the mashayikh who are ala ra'si wal ayn. My advice to people to prepare for Ramadan is to minimize your ghafla and increase, increase your dhikr. Wallahi al-azim, if there was no virtue for dhikr in this world, other than the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a hadith al-Qudsi, وَإِن ذَكَرَنِي فِي نَفْسِهِ ذَكَرْتُهُ فِي نَفْسِهِ That was enough. There was never a need for any other virtue. Where Allah subhanahu wa says in a hadith al-Qudsi, that when he remembers me in his heart, I remember him. I don't know, just let us settle in. There are times in my life where I feel lonely and I feel like people don't understand. That I've been inserted into a construct that my heart feels foreign in. And in those moments of loneliness, the best thing you could do is just remember Allah. Because Allah will remember you. وَإِن ذَكَرَنِي فِي مَلَئٍ ذَكَرْتُهُ فِي مَلَئٍ خَيْرٍ مِنْ but if he remembers me in a gathering, I will remember him in a gathering better than My dear friends, brothers and sisters, I don't have much more to say. There is a lot that could be said. I don't have anything else to say. I think I'm done. To summarize what we discussed today, as Ramadan approaches, we must prepare. Don't lose confidence. Don't think that you can't do it. Don't give in. So what if we fail? We'll fail a hundred times. But then we'll try again to love Allah. But then we might fail. But we'll try again to love Allah. But we might fail. But we'll try again to love Allah. I think we have to learn to find pleasure in trying. And when we fail, maybe that in itself is a blessing from Allah that we just don't see today. Because the one who passes stopped trying. And for us broken souls, there must be a pleasure, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and a joy that when he sees his servants, the beautiful, amazing Mufti Suhails, who are still trying. 
Rah, that's mine. O oh, Malaika, you objected to the creation of Adam and Banu Adam. They don't stop trying. Broken they are, but they're mine. That's the view. We don't give up, my friends. Keep going. But every day that Allah gives you a chance to do the dhikr, do it with pride, with joy. There are people who will live in this world and they will live and die and not once in their life will they get a chance to say the name of Allah with love. Not once. And here we are. As much as we want. My uncles and aunts until today are not Muslim. Many of you know, as Mr. Sahel mentioned at the beginning, my mother was a Hindu convert to Islam. When I look at their WhatsApp avatars and pictures, they have Hindu gods there. My heart breaks. I could have been, I could have been sitting at the feet of a god, of some idol. But yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed at the feet of us, at my mother. And we weren't born into kufr. Some of you may be very far from it. I'm very close to it. And then when I do sajda in front of Allah, I think, Allah, Ya Allah, I could have been in the fire of hell. You could have deprived me of you. I wouldn't have known you. I wouldn't have been able to try to even love you. This is all your father. And after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us his father, if we still follow his favor, after he gives us his favor, if we still choose to be neglectful, then then that person has truly uh, lost out. And we shouldn't be those people. Ramadan's around the corner, my friends. Get rid of that. Oh, yeah. Bring in that state of remembrance. I have a lot to say, by the way, but my time has uh, concluded. So I also begin to conclude my speech. Otherwise, if you really reflect over the issue of ghafla and dhikr and internalize it properly, there are many complicated issues that can be solved. I have four kids. Three of them are boys. My older son is in middle school. And I've had an issue of getting them to pray salah. Not that they don't like praying it, but I'm the sergeant drill at home who every few hours begins to shout, Salah time, Salah time, Salah time. And they're always just like so annoyed. But they're not annoyed. They're a little agitated. I think that's more, more correct. They're a little agitated. So I've been thinking about this for some time on how to address this and change my approach and change the tone so we can accomplish the same goal of them praying without the agitation. And I found a solution. Maybe another time we'll discuss it another day. And it's embedded in the issue of ghafla. It's embedded in the issue of ghafla. But another time, inshallah, Allah gives us tawfiq and himma. Ramadan is a season, my friends, special. It's special. So let's make this a special Ramadan, inshallah. Let's make this a Ramadan of dhikr. Buy yourself at the sbih, keep yourself going. Don't get involved with just lip service where you're just saying something without focusing. Do it with your heart as well. Focus. And with that, I conclude. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes his Mubarak Ramadan a special Ramadan that he accepts it, he accepts it from us all. Wa sallallahu Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad kama sallayta ala Sayyidina Ibrahim wa ala ala Sayyidina Ya Allah, raise our hands in front of you across the world we are, but in one gathering, we ask that your shower your mercy upon all of us. Ya Allah, engulf us in your rahmah. Ya Allah, grant us afia. Ya Allah, grant us barakah. Ilaha al-alameen, grant us hearts that love you. Ya Allah, grant us tongues that remember you. Ya Allah, purify our hearts. Ya Allah, keep us pure and protected from shaitan and his traps. Ilaha al-alameen, protect us and our progeny. Ya Allah, bless, bless the institute and the scholars who lead the organization. Open up their path of risk. Ilaha la alameen. Allow them to continue to serve the people in an honorable and beneficial manner. Ya Allah, all of those that have joined us today, we ask that you bless them with al nafi'a amul salih. Ya Allah, in da'a mustajab, ya Rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala sallallahu ala Muhammad. Ameen, ya Rabbil alameen. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.